Hungry Trilobite Podcast would like to start by acknowledging these fine conventions. SoonerCon. Despite the pandemic, Central Oklahoma's longest-running pop culture convention is back. They will hold their next event in June of 2022. To support them, fans and artists have rallied together on their Kickstarter, which you can visit. The Kickstarter will run through February 2nd. Go to SoonerCon.com for more details. The Hellmouth Convention. The Hellmouth Convention is a celebration of all pop culture, but specifically things like Buffy, Angel, Firefly, and Dr. Horrible. It is held in Los Angeles, California, and the next event is scheduled for June 3rd through 5th, 2022. Proceeds benefit the Los Angeles LGBT Center as well as the Ron Glass Memorial Scholarship Fund. For more information, go to thehellmouth.org. On tap today, we have Tiffany Lovett. How are you doing this fine day? Good. I'm doing really great. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here. You know, we have talked about all sorts of things online. We're both big fans of Trek. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I like doing on the show is seeing where people's fandom leads them in their lives. It's pretty common that people get into sci-fi and they want to start writing or drawing or making movies. Athletics is not uncommon, but you're the only person I know who has gotten into figure skating as a direct result of your fandom. Mm -hmm. I have. And how did that come about? So originally, you know, I got in the track because of my parents, especially my dad. He loved sci-fi. He had a friend who also was a big sci-fi fan and he had, you know, Trek episodes on VHS. And so when I got into, you know, Trek as a kid, I just started watching the show and liking, you know, the costumes, the story, the way, you know, everything goes. And then as I got older, when I got into Trek again during the pandemic, I was like, what can I do to make it, you know, different and enjoyable for people, you know, appreciate Trek, but, you know, a different viewpoint, (laughs) so. And clearly you didn't just like pick up a pair of skates and start on this You've been doing that part of your life for years. Yeah, I have. Like the fun story I like telling people too is I started skating the year after Deep Space Nine ended their show. (laughs) So, you know, one show ends and then someone's career starts. So Yes. And so that's now been 20 years ago for the people who don't keep track of Trek as the way you and I do. Yeah. (laughs) 23, if I'm accounting correctly. It's um, 22. It's going to be 23 this year. Oh, yeah. It's. And so you've been practicing, and when you do this, you actually attribute the dances you do and the moves you make. And full disclosure, I don't know much about figure skating, so if no, I say fine. yeah, stupid. it's called dance too sometimes because there is ice dance, and you know the choreography and the movement. It all comes from dance that you do off ice. Some people take, you know, ballroom dancing and extra dance classes to help transition that over. And guys what you're doing is you're actually incorporating star trek music into this yeah i try to like you know feel the music and see what movements can go with it because you know it's sometimes it is sometimes hard because there are some songs that don't fit with ice skating people who again aren't really trek oriented and those people Mm -hmm. are listening they're not necessarily going to realize that trek goes back over 50 years there are nine 10 tv show soundtracks 13 yeah. movie soundtracks the, the body of music that can go with it is huge it so is you have a yeah. lot to draw from there is a lot of choices to choose from and it's all just you know playing around figuring out what goes with your skating style and what songs can't fit into skating and what songs can't you know because sometimes there are songs that just can't <laughs> Um, somebody that knows a lot more about Star Trek than I do about ice skating. What is your style? What? How did you find your groove? For me, because, like, you know, growing up, when I first started skating, I watched a skating show that had a lot of different music styles and it inspired me to want to experiment and see, OK, like, I like this song. So what what can I do with it? <laughs> and then I realized, you know, I'm a powerful skater and I also love artistry. So, you know, combine combine the two is there a, was there a certain one that you listened to it and it was like the deep space nine theme and then you just realized this is the one this is my jam yeah the deep space nine one and also the voyager one and a little bit of the um tng one because that one did sound sound like something you'd skate to maybe not the whole program but partly 
for like free skate in a competition. <laughs> the TNG theme, which, you know, they pulled from the original motion picture is definitely, it's a bit of a march. I, there's definitely a lot of movement inherent in that music. Yeah. And you've actually taken it to this point now where you're touring or you're trying to at least get your work yeah. out there. I've been, you know, trying to do auditions for shows, but you know, it's competitive. And skating, everything's competitive. So you just got to keep trying. And even if you don't get in, people will know your name and see your videos. And that's just the important part. They know you exist in the skating community. When you see skating on TV, which I realize is it's like the upper echelon of professional yeah. skaters. It's, it's, yeah. it's the super all-stars. You're saying it's competitive, but there seems to be a lot of camaraderie there. It's not quite as cutthroat as some other sports I could think of, but she was not the no. same. Like, I think when you get into like, you know, the skating you see right now at the Olympics, you know, free skate, like the jump, the more of the jumping, that's where it gets competitive because everyone wants to do quads or do the next rotation jump. They want to be the first person to do it or try to match up to that person. <laughs> so. And it's just, I, I see that camaraderie and I think of the, the community that we build as fans that we've talked about on uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, yeah. we, we we unite this common interest together, and in your case, two disinterest, two, two not common interests, and you manage to fuse them, and that's really powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As when you've seen that that you, you put your work out there, what kind of response have you gotten? Um, I've gotten a lot of surprising responses. Like you know, for me, I just love to share and hopefully, you know, whoever sees it gets inspired or inspired to either want to go ice skate or want to watch Trek and want to do both. And I remember the first time one of my skating videos got responses because I was playing around with Deep Space Nine, the Deep Space Nine theme. And I uploaded it to the Facebook page, like the one of the bigger groups. So a lot of the VIPs are in it. Oh, and I was very surprised that a lot of VIPs took notice of it. Like they didn't, not all of them commented because, you know, sometimes they just look at stuff, but they don't have time. And I remember the first response I got was probably from Casey Biggs, Legget Damar. Mm -hmm. And it was really, really shocking to hear Legget Damar say, wow, your skating is beautiful. I want to see more of it. Well, it's surprising because, like I said, this is not something that happens that often. No. I mean, I'm an author. And that's that's great. Yay. But like, uh, there's a lot of authors in the Trek sphere. I don't feel I'm particularly unique just on that. There are not a lot of skaters. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like when you go on YouTube and you type in Star Trek ice skating, you just see like a few videos, maybe that really old one from the time they did a Trek show at a theme park. And then there's one guy who used Trek music for his competition and then that's it. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure somewhere in some boardroom, somebody tossed around the idea of doing Star Trek on ice and it just didn't take off for whatever yeah. reason. Like, but you know yeah. that conversation was had. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I feel like it could, like if they didn't want to do a big show, they can try to do a little show for maybe the cruise tours, you know? Because yeah. ice skating is popular on cruises. I did not know that. And I'm a cruise fan, so I, I didn't know that. So you're, you're teaching me something new here. I was actually just there thinking with that boat rocking back and forth, yeah. skating seems like it would be a challenge. Yeah, but they somehow do it because I know I have friends who've done, you know, tours on the cruises, like not Star Trek, but the regular cruises, they do on shows. Um, I've seen in the dances, for example, on cruise ships, it seems like there's a certain focus on not taking yourself too far to the edge of the stage because if that boat rocks suddenly, you yeah, can find you don't want to smack yourself. Because I there was a story to this one skater. He talked about how he was doing a backflip, and one time the boat kind of rocked, so in the middle of his back backflip, he fell and hit his face on the ice. And very painful, but yeah, you don't want to, you know, have some off timing like that. Mm -hmm. So. When you're talking about this kind of stuff, what's your grand ambition if, if you do get noticed, if you do take this to the next step? I don't know. I kind of hope maybe someone in the Trek community does get inspired to maybe bring a show or just bring me over and say, hey, we want someone to talk about, you know, skating and Trek at a convention or maybe on the cruise. I don't know. <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah. And because I mean, even if they didn't do a show, which I understand it is a lot of money and resources and trying to find the right person you know to do it i 
I can only imagine just getting the the ice down would be, you know, yeah. a logistical, not complication, but yeah, I could see that being an issue. Yeah. So you talk about conventions. What's your favorite convention? Well, I've never been to any before yet, oh, but okay. I always found the Vegas one to be interesting. Yes, Vegas. I, I only went once, but it was one of the best trips I ever took convention wise. Yeah. Uh, it's the idea of having this giant building filled with Trek fans. Because I mean, I, I've had the smaller conventions, which I'm a big fan of those. Yeah. But you're talking about being in a, at a convention center or a hotel ballroom. And mm -hmm. once you kind of leave that bubble, you're back in the real world. But Vegas doesn't feel like that. And the fact that you can walk around with a cocktail in your hand doesn't hurt any at all. I promise you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you can make that, I would suggest doing it for sure. Yeah. Because I've heard a lot of good stories about it. Um, compared to some of the ones where a lot of people comment how it's more corporate feel. Like, mm -hmm. you know. It's definitely big. I mean, it's run by creation. And yeah. they, they're kind of the textbook version of corporate, but they do a really good job. There's, there's a lot of things that happen in Vegas that you really have a hard time seeing happen at other conventions. Yeah, they, so, they have yeah I money. think that, that's good to know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've seen you, you some of your practice videos. Where are you based out of? So I'm in San Diego, California. Yeah. So Comic-Con is right in your back door. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm in the same state as a couple of the Kardashian actors. So, oh. <laughs> yeah. Just give them a couple of free tickets to the show sometime. I'm sure they. Yeah. Casey I'm actually have... friends with one of them on Facebook because, like, he liked one of my arts and he reached out. He's like, hey, I love your art and I just want to connect. So I was like, okay. <laughs> that is amazing. Because that's the kind of thing we couldn't do, I'd say, before the internet, but really social media made that popular. Yeah, because I remember, you know, back in 82 when I was in a, just more trying to send fan mail because that was a bigger thing before social media. That's That was like probably the only way you can try to connect with people like that. Just through I, fan mail or going to conventions. Yes. Yeah. And this past week, I've had a lot of thought on how bad social media can be. Yeah. Can. Uh, and, and we know this. I mean, I'm not going to, you know, try to talk about the, the obvious things about how the toxicity, but when it can be great it can be so great yeah it can be because <laughs> for me i'm the type of person you can feel like energy through people's words and text online so when i do get stressed i'm like yeah it's probably time to take a break <laughs> i don't i don't feel comfortable you know i don't want to stress myself out because as a skater i gotta concentrate i can't let stuff online get in my mind while trying to train no but at the same time to actually have the chance of taking your art which is coming from the place of a, a, you're a beginner, or at least you're, you're not well known. And you can immediately connect with somebody who's at the other end of that spectrum, somebody who is literally your inspiration. Yeah. And that's a chance that we wouldn't have had before social media. I mean, we could try no. to do it through the, the, the old web 1.0. It yeah. didn't really work that easily. And plus without YouTube back then, there would probably be no way for people to see a video too well. No. YouTube is an amazing resource and the fact that we can put something together and I can have that program in China as quickly as I can have it down the street. Yeah. That's something that is amazing. And I th there's a lot of power to that. I try to tell people that we're in an age now where you can create and get your stuff out there. So there's no reason not to. No. Like, even if, you know, you get rejected, it's still a nice feeling for people to see it. And then it, sometimes they can go reconsider and go back to it and go, you know what? I changed my mind, you know? Mm -hmm. As Trek fans, we're very used to that concept where somebody sees something new and they're like, this sucks. Yeah. And then a couple of years later, they go back like, oh, okay, I see what they were going for. And it, it actually is kind of cool. I just yeah. wasn't ready for it at that time. I mean, it's okay to be like not ready for it at the time. Mm -hmm. It's just you don't want to, you know, be constantly trying to tell people what's wrong. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and everything was new. Everything was different. And everything went through that initial phase of this isn't for me. And yeah. it might never be for you. But give yourself the freedom to come back to it at some point. Yeah. I, I kind of got that way with, you know, several, several major video games, actually. I, I am a, a game guy. But there were a lot of things that I... I got into like, for example, 
Uh, have you ever played Luigi's Mansion on the GameCube? Yeah, I have. How do you feel about it? I feel okay about it. Like, it was different. Okay. <laughs> I was so used to the traditional Mario stories, so. I got into it, and, you know, I picked it up when it was pretty new. Yeah. It just wasn't for me at that point in time. And it didn't mean it was a bad game. It didn't mean it wasn't a great game. It just, the what I wanted out of it at that point wasn't there. But I can go back to it anytime I want. It's sitting right there on the shelf. Yeah. One thing we don't think about with the way we, we make media these days is that almost nothing is temporary. Everything is always going to be there if you put in the elbow grease to get to it. Yeah. I think that's number- the problem too. Like a lot of people expect Trek shows to be 100% perfect. And it's like, they all, no, the perfection doesn't exist. You can't have no. it perfect because it's impossible for everyone to like it and everyone to, you know, not like it and that's okay if they don't like it they don't like it and if they like it they like it right you know and as i've said bad art is the natural byproduct of good art yeah if you're trying to make something stellar you're going to have to always run the risk that you doesn't work out yeah that it ends up being a misstep that it doesn't resonate with people and that's okay if you don't if you always make the same thing and it feels great, and the same people like it over and over. Nothing, it's going to get stale. And yeah, it's going to get like static, like just stays the same, and you know, it gets boring after a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we we can't do that. So everything always has to take risk, and it's okay if those risks don't pay off. Yeah. I like guess you're a big fan of Shrek. What are some of your other fandoms? I like um, Babylon Five. Okay. So as a kid, I grew up watching that too. And, you know, at the time I thought it was related to Trek. <laughs> Not unreasonable. Yeah. And then when I found out later, I was like, oh, okay, it's a different show. <laughs> it's on. I grew up in the era when people would say, Star Trek, is that the one with Luke Skywalker? <laughs> because both were kind of in a narrow, fallow point in their life. Yeah, and they but they're didn't... completely different, though. Like, even yeah. as a kid, for me, I knew it was different. <laughs> in the 90s, especially, was kind of this mini golden age of science fiction in general. If you could stand your science fiction being kind of on the cheap side and a few minutes too short, there were so many shows you could get into. Yeah. Uh, and I almost missed that because what we're getting now is fantastic but it's all polished to the nth degree and the production values are so high that there are some risks that aren't being taken. Yeah. So I kind of miss the days when things would just be thrown against the wall and it might only last a season. Yeah. I think we need that, like more, you know, creativity, even if it's not going to last long. It's like, at least you tried, you mm-hmm. did something. <laughs> Earth 2, I'm looking in your direction. Yeah. People always bring up Firefly. It's like, yeah, Firefly is great, but Earth 2. <laughs> <laughs> And a lot of that now, like we're saying, you, we can do that as fans, as, as individual artists, we can put stuff together. And YouTube is just as good a distribution platform as anything for, for fan productions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. And so I'm, I'm really glad you're doing what you're doing. And what are you feeling about Trek these days? We're, we're just for the, anybody who's not getting this right away. Discovery is wrapping up its fourth season. Picard is about to start. Uh, Strange New World is going to be later in the year. So we're we're at a yeah. really neat, exciting time in Trek history. Yeah. I think for me, like, I find it good that there's a lot of new, different kind of Trek coming out. Because it's been a long time since we had a lot of Trek coming out at the same time. Mm-hmm. And for me, like, some of the shows I don't like, but it's okay. Because, you know, maybe I'll go back and like it (laughs) Mm -hmm. but I think it's good because then it gives people a choice you know to see which one you know clicks with them and sometimes what clicks with you might just be a matter of the stage in your life yeah because you know these shows are written from a perspective of, of of many generations it's it's something that you might have a story that's written for an older audience or a younger audience and you need to revisit it with different life experiences well, yeah, because I think what people forget, too, is like the, the target are like audience. Like, for example, there are people who don't like Prodigy and it's like, well, the target audience is, 
kids, but also the families of those kids and mm -hmm. some fans that do like those characters, you know, like Janeway and Chakotay and all that. I, I mean, it's very easy to like, we pick out Wrath of the Khan as like the best Trek movie ever. It, there's certainly an argument to be made, right? Yeah. But that movie is literally about them getting old in a way that wasn't acknowledged and people could be like well it's it's a movie you know they they, they just made everybody old but well, they were old okay that was the point that was the story that that these are actual characters who grow and evolve and that's what we're supposed to be talking about with science fiction growing and evolving oh yeah like I, if you want a situation where everything is the same at the end of the episode that's what sitcoms are for yeah <laughs> And I'm not down on that. I'm just saying that there's a certain time and place for that formula. And science fiction usually works best when you don't know what's going to happen by the end. When you yeah, give when it's yourself... a surprise, you know, right? You're not going to expect it. When you're you're looking at Babylon Five, is there a, a difference you see between that and the tone of Trek that's just unique to Babylon Five? Yeah, like I get. I'm not really good at explaining it, but it's like, there's just, when I watch it, I can see the differences on how they handle the story mm -hmm. and the way they, their lines are compared to how they talk in Trek. It's a lot of times there, there's a Trek, a, a, a Trek mindset, a Trek philosophy. That's the word I'm looking for. Thank you. Uh, it, it's where, you know, everything comes back to the core ideals of, of Starfleet that, you know, unity togetherness finding value and in, in diversity they're not really great at telling stories that that's not the answer that that talk about strife and struggle and that basically the trek doesn't do dystopia well <laughs> yeah and i think that's one of the reasons people have trouble with discovery is that they had to venture into that territory yeah and i think that's one of the greatest things they've done is that they've gone into that territory and they've come back successfully mm, yeah like uh, stargate for example how do you feel about that i don't watch it too much so i can't really say fair enough but, but yeah. it's, it's like it's stargate is largely a story of we're the good guys and the aliens are the bad guys <laughs> not a very trek storyline at all but oh. <laughs> it yeah. tells it well yeah and you know, I, I think that fans do best when they let themselves branch out. And uh, so, like I said, I'm not an ice skating expert by any stretch. Is, yeah. I'm guessing if you're in San Diego, a warm climate, you don't have much of a winter, you go to the, you get to practice all year long because you probably have a specialized skating arena park. Yeah, indoor rinks. So okay. over down here, we have like about like five of them. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And then once a week, I go up to Irvine to their rink, and it's this new one that has like four surfaces inside. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, I'm, obviously, there's a pretty big skating community there if they can support that many rinks. Yeah. Because right, cause that's the rink, too, where um, Nathan Chen trains at whenever oh. he's not going to school like when he comes back for visiting <laughs> sure yeah i guess i would be remiss if i didn't mention the olympics right now as well yeah and you're probably watching that a little more closely than i am yeah <laughs> i think everybody's watching a little more closely than i am but what, what are you thinking with with your observations on that um i think it's really good that we finally like for skating we finally had a male from the U.S. win because it's been such a long time since we had any American skaters on the podium. It, you got to take a little pride in that. It's, it's the Olympics. Everybody argues about them every time it comes up. Yeah, I uh, get no it. matter which Olympics it is, like summer, winter, some everyone's talking about it. But can we agree that the concept of the Olympics is still great? Yeah. That, that actually having everybody come together for a mutual competition yeah. in the spirit of peace, in the mm -hmm. spirit of peace, is a good thing. Yeah, it is. And, like that, that unity. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you, obviously, there's some drama every year. Don't need to dwell on that. But it seems like that if we keep trying it, 
there's got to be a reason why. Yeah. I think, you know, the drama all the time, I think people just like, you know, the, that always comes up because, you know, people seem to not be able to live without it. <laughs> it's like everybody. Yes. Like, oh. You're right. That's exactly it. Is that yeah. people need it. It's what we fixate on. We can't just be happy. It's like, oh, it's so boring. And we got to spice it up, you know, <laughs> something like that. Which is you know, amazing because I think that that's something us fans have tried, not successfully, but we have tried to get to the point where we're just being happy with stuff. Yeah. I, I sometimes wonder if, if could we ever just get to the point where we accept that something is awesome and we just let it be. Yeah, I think it'll still, you know, a lot more to go before we get to that point, probably. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. So, Tiffany, is there a way that you know could you put together a, a Star Trek related skating troupe team? like a synchro team um you tell me i don't know i think i think it'd work though if i did like you know a theater on ice team which is more showcasing like artistry and telling a story mm -hmm. i think it could work that way i could see you know putting together a, a youtube mini series on that just a, a couple i mean obviously getting everybody together on a regular basis would be tough but yeah just i'm for finding a one -time. skaters who'd want to do that and we're into track so <laughs> Maybe we could reach out and find people in the area or any who might be willing to meet up who could give it a shot. Maybe. <laughs> I guess my last question, now that I'm thinking about this, could you skate in cosplay? I don't know. I could try. <laughs> I, I don't know, because I'm sure you need the flexibility, but and those costumes are not very forgiving. Yeah, it depends like what outfit you're wearing <laughs> and the Fair material. Enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Season one next gen might be the best you could hope for. Yeah, I think so. I think that's it's the already spandex. Yeah. <laughs> so where can people track your adventures and see your work? So for skating videos, they can always go to my YouTube channel. If you just type in Tiffany Love It, they'll find a few skating clips on there. Plus and some you... of my Galaxy Con interviews I did. Cool. One on one chats. And you are on Twitter as well? Um, well, right now I'm taking a break, but I'm on Instagram. So okay. Well, I will link to everything in the show notes on my website, AaronBossig.com. Tiffany, thanks so much for being here. I've had a lot of fun and I really enjoy talking with you. Yeah. And it was good seeing you. <laughs> finally. Good seeing you. Likewise. Yeah. <laughs>